Hi there and welcome to the 15th episode of Career Stories Live. So I'm really pleased today to have Kevin D. Turner here to join me. So welcome, Kevin. Thanks for coming on. Thank you, sir. I'm, I'm excited. I love the whole live events that you're doing. I think it's fantastic and I know it helps many. So that's always exciting because why do this otherwise, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Thank you. So um, I can see Jeff's already here. So he is Yay. saying, can't wait to see you to show off your brand. Be real and never doubt today. Excellent. Thank you, Jeff. He's got front row. <laughs> yes, <laughs> indeed. Um, okay. So anyone that is watching, please do comment. Let's say that you're here where you're joining from and feel free to ask any questions and share your experiences in your in the comments. Um, so Kevin and I connected in January 2021. I can't remember exactly um, where it was that we connected or who connected us i've just noticed we're not actually live on linkedin we're just live on uh, youtube that's interesting i'm just oh. gonna see if anything happens there okay oh, okay now we're live jeff is in the house excellent jeff okay us, right <laughs> jeff yeah so we weren't live now we are so um, oh, i'm just gonna go back to the beginning again say so welcome to the 15th episode of career stories live so anyone that's watching on youtube it went live on youtube but not on linkedin for some reason so um, Kevin, welcome again. So thank you, thank you for joining. Um, and please do comment to let us know that you're here, anyone that is here watching, um, and let us know any questions you've got, any comments, etc. So the basis for these lives that I'm doing, I've always been really interested in what people do and why they do it. So that's kind of the idea for the lives. So I'm here really to talk to people about their careers and where they've got to um, and why they're doing it. So uh, slightly uh, flustered there, but let's go on now to Kevin's headline. So in your headline, Kevin, you say brand to land, eliminating personal blending with the sharpest tools and strategies for your professional success. So can you elaborate on that and tell us a bit about what it is you do right now? Absolutely. And, and part of that whole message is throwing something out there that makes you stand out. Right. And that is personal branding. So personal blending, people always go, that's that's kind of cool. That's funny. I like that it makes me stand out. And to me, what personal branding is, is kind of that inadvertent uh, demarketing of oneself where you just throw everything you've got into a LinkedIn profile or into a resume or anything else. And you think they'll figure it out if I just give them everything. Right? Yeah. And that is personal branding. And the opposite end of that is give them nothing and they'll figure it out. That doesn't work either, right? And yeah. so my job, what I do, is basically help organizations and individuals figure out what do they bring to the table? How can they present it in a way that everybody's going to remember? And so yeah. Yeah, that's key in the digital world that we live in. We also live in the real world too, but in that digital world, those kind of memorable statements, those kind of memorable branding has a huge effect in where we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. So we've got someone watching. So that's great. Thank you, Sandra. D marketing. That's a new one to me. Thank you, Sandra. <laughs> Thank you for not something yeah. you want to do. <laughs> no, definitely not. Definitely not. Okay. So I, I know we could talk about branding and blending all day, but let's, uh, let's talk about your career. So let's go to the start. And how did you land that first role at Sony? You know, I've always been kind of a techie, love technology, when I look at the technology back then, it was pretty basic, right? It was kind of primitive. It was almost Fred Flintstone technology. But I love technology. And in high school, I targeted some of the largest electronic organizations around the world. And I wrote letters to the CEOs, uh, you know, to head of marketing, CMOs. And I presented myself as an American teenager who's grown up in several different countries, had a different perspective loves marketing, loves technology. How can I intern with you so I can give you my American teenage insights, right? That was the market they all wanted to be in with a lot of the new products. And so I thought, okay, I've got an opportunity here. So I think I wrote a couple dozen letters. And uh, the one that really stood out to me, though, it, I had several responses, but the one that stood out to me was Sony. And it okay. was, you know, basically, will you come and intern in Japan with us wow. for a summer. Um, we're going to put you on the line. You're going to understand that. Then we're going to send you out on these walkabout marketing trips where, you know, and I helped launch uh, the Walkman 
which was actually wow. called Walkabout at the time. Yeah. What, we, what was then called the camcorder, which was like this big. And then it had another case that was like that big you put over your, but it was called the camcorder, right? Yeah. Family use. It, it was huge. They would get you that stuff and they would send you out. They'd put a few, you know, yen in your pocket, a few hundred yen in pocket and send you out and say, show this to people, demo this to people. So you'd head to the big parks, you know, you'd wear the Walkman. I would, before that, I'd go to the music store and buy a bunch of new music, right? And that Walkman at the time had two headphones, you know? And so you would just, you know, walk up to people and put it on. <laughs> God, these are so polite that they would let me do this. And they would giggle and they'd laugh and they'd be like, this is fantastic. And where do I get this? And it's like, it's not available yet, but would you want it, right? And so I was out there collecting that marketing feedback and love that, you know, that's high school. But it was very proactive, went to college, focused on marketing and sales. And the first place I came back to was Sony. They were having a hiring freeze. Right. They um, were at that point, the economy was horrible in the U.S. Uh, we had just had uh, all sorts of disruptions, banking, I think 5,000 banks closed in the United States. So business wasn't really happy, right? But because of the story, and that's how I applied, I didn't apply online to the position. Again, I sent a letter to uh, the um, CEO in the US. I sent a letter to the um, people who were um, in different departments, like marketing department, product department. And I basically said, you know, I had this incredible experience. It created my drive through uh, college to learn how to market things. And I'd love to come work for Sony. And, you know, wow. I was thinking, uh, you know, it's going to be up in New Jersey. That's corporate headquarters. That's where I sent all my notes. I get a call from Dallas, Texas, right? Actually Irving, which nobody knows what that is, but that's about <laughs> by the airport. And they said, we'd like to talk to you. We don't have any positions, but we'd like to talk to you. And the uh, regional VP there created a position with a little bit of slush funds, right? He created a position. Yeah. This is what we want you to do. And it was call on just retailers, take brochures out, understand what their issues are, train them, right? So that's how it got started. It was the lowest level position. I think the janitor may, may have made more money in Irving than I did at the time, but it was a start, right? And that's amazing. rapidly within Sony, I always focused on well, what's next how do I do what I'm doing right now better than anybody else? And then what's next so I can focus part of what I'm doing into getting me to that next step. And so I always worked on special projects that took you above and beyond what people normally thought of you in your position. Right. I actually presented at Sony's national convention. I presented something called consultative selling, which nobody had heard of at that time. That's very much mm -hmm. like, social selling in a way it's about listening to the customer before you present right yeah. find yeah. out what the needs are build a relationship and then they'll come to you and ask how can you help me make this happen and so that was kind of consultative selling so i did that at the national convention started up <clears throat> programs to uh, take camcorders that were very new at the time and they were competing with vhs it was eight millimeter started actually event programs so we could get people to have free exposure to them. These are kind of things that nobody had thought about. They weren't traditional to the positions I had, but they accelerated my brand within the company. So they saw more value in that. And, uh, you know, I went from uh, that uh, uh, entry level uh, servicing area into marketing, doing these campaigns. I then went into sales and ended up having, you know, number one salesperson's award at Sony National Convention for my sales. And I thought, this is fantastic. I'm doing great. I'm making lots of money. I'm, I'm having fun. Two weeks later, they tell me that they've decided to take the sales division that I'm in, right? And transition it all to um, a third party individuals who are gonna sell it, wholesalers, right? right? So we're not gonna need any salespeople anymore. Right. So I, you know, at that point, they're talking about, you know, you've been with Sony almost, you know, 10 years. We'll give you a nice transition package. You know, I think it was uh, 
back then it was a month for every year. So I was like, hey, that's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. But I don't want to leave yet. And uh, I focused on Sony opening up a brand new division called Sony Qualcomm, which was bringing phones, uh, CDMA phones, to the U.S. And they came together because Sony had the technology to build the phones. Qualcomm had the CDMA coding, right, technology on that side. And by coming together, they were able to create this division. And in that division, I rose up into national sales. So I was doing about 200 million a year, had about seven people reporting to me. Again, fantastic, right? I'm thinking, this is perfect. I'm at, you know, an age, this is about, you know, 11 years into my career. And I'm thinking, this is great. Everything mm -hmm. is working. Well, it turned out that the management of Sony and Qualcomm could not agree on things. They were butting heads. They were having problems show up in one factory that didn't show up on another. They were not sharing information. And uh, my parents at that time, right, uh, my company mm -hmm. parents, they decided to get a divorce. <laughs> they said, By the way, we're getting a divorce and <laughs> go and be happy. And I thought, you know, I just tradition from the traditional Sony. And yeah. You know what? Going into this joint venture, this new thing, because I'm always been an adventurer, right? I went, to, mm -hmm. went for it because of that. And the other thing was ending. I thought, you know, this is, uh, I'm going to lose that whole transition package, right? They asked me to stay at Sony, to come back and to sell general audio, which was like Walkman, Discman, that kind of stuff, and kind of do what I used to do. And I was like, I can't do that anymore. Right. I've tasted mm -hmm. something different. I tasted management of people. And that was one of my passions. I love doing that. And so I said, I'm, I'm not coming back. You know, I, I went into the, the Sony Qualcomm component. But at that point, when all that ended, they still gave me my transition. OK, so very happy in that. So, yeah in part of my relationship over at Sony Qualcomm, part of doing things that are kind of above and beyond the job, I started meeting with the product group, product design group, talking about triangulation of phones, which basically means if you've got a cell phone, especially a CDMA at the time, they could triangulate you with three towers and within 25 feet, they could pinpoint you. So it was privacy issues. Yeah. Right? They yeah. wanted to sell that technology to the carriers to say, if you can pinpoint him within a few feet, you can say, don't go to Barb's, go to John's right. Cafe, yeah. here's a $5 yeah. coupon, right? So they could drive ad revenue. They could do so many things. They could then predict your likability of doing things based on location, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and that really piqued my interest because I started thinking about privacy and living internationally, I thought, started thinking about it's different in every country. Everybody has yeah. a different view. You know? Yeah. Um, you know, Europe has been mostly data privacy, uh, you know, in that sense. Uh, here, it, it's considered personal privacy for a long time. Uh, they always thought that um, here that the companies owned it or the individuals owned it. That was the fight. In Europe, it was always, you know, the government owned it which now has transitioned more back towards the people. Yeah. But knowing that that had gone on and I was now in transition mode, right? With, with yeah. many months of, you know, funding to kind of figure out what to do. I approached a venture capital group and that was Stone Investments. And there were three lawyers there who were working on privacy issues. And I captured their interest with the story I was telling and this was going on and this is going to be big in this industry. And, we actually created a company called Privacy Council. And Privacy Council within this venture group was one of their projects. I was a, a part owner to it. And it was really about focusing on how to help, at that time, U.S. companies, but it ended up being global companies, how to help them make privacy an advantage, a competitive advantage. So how yeah. do you give to the consumer that, that trust that sense of, uh, you know, you own this and here's how we're going to use this for you, right, to build that. And then how do you do it on a global basis? And, you know, at the time, websites were hot, uh, you know, basically, you know, you don't open up a website for a state or a city. You're open to the world. 
And yeah. so we had to go out and educate companies that this existed, you know, in, in that sense. But had I not been thinking about kind of separating myself at Sony Qualcomm and doing some of these things that are above and beyond what I would normally do, I yeah. wouldn't have that little extra angle to go after. That's right? really cool. Yeah. We, we've got so it, it's really about kind of parlaying things. Yeah into the next opportunity, you know? Uh, twice at Sony, I was forced. Yeah. Four times at Sony, I made choices, right? Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. now I'm in this venture capital group and that company actually did extremely well. It ran circles around uh, the big five uh, consulting groups, so much so we actually got one of the principals for uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers to leave and become, you know, part of our management team. That's was awesome. Huge. Yeah, that's we were huge. Embarrassing them when it got down to, you know, how does privacy become an advantage? And a couple of things that I built during that time frame is I built the first global library of privacy laws, translated into 17 different languages, and put it out there for free. Well, why would you wow. do that, right? It's a yeah, lot of work. There's a lot of money in there. It was a flash map. It was really kind of cool. But we did that because that was the attraction. There's the hook to bring people yeah, in. Yeah, privacy yeah. Filter, right? Yeah. Again, it's about bringing that brand. And any time we're doing that, if we're doing it for the company, that's fantastic. That's going to build that business. That's going to make things better. But anytime you do that, it also makes your brand better. Yeah. So I always yeah. talk about kind of uh, incorporating the corporate into your brand, right? So yeah. you become a loyal team player, but it also develops you and makes you stand out from everybody else in that organization that may have that same position. So Yeah, that's really cool. Uh, yeah. We've got loads of comments. Uh, <laughs> Kevin, so I'm going to quickly jump, jump on to those. So we've got Craig saying, about time in the house. No. <laughs> <laughs> John saying, good to see you in more film. So, yeah, so last time I was live from a bar in uh, Bristol, so it was a bit loud. <laughs> and Kevin is the man. Jeff saying, you could call it dis marketing too, Sandra. Uh, Chris is saying 9 a.m. ET. I, I don't know. Pro probably, I guess. It's, it was 1 p.m. here that we went live, so that's probably about right. Uh, 6 a.m., 6 a.m. for Dan Roth. Um, okay. Jeff Early. knows Irving. Okay. Uh, Craig saying exactly the same thing happened in private healthcare, Kevin, so that's cool. And um, we've got Marty saying hello. Excellent. Um, and then Dan saying, do we need to explain to the audience what Walkman is? I mean, I have to say that was, <laughs> that was an amazing story. It was, um, yeah, it kind of took me right back to my Walkman, walking around yeah. this town with my Walkman on. It's, it just showed such courage, I think, from, a, I guess, teen, late teenager to, to yeah. do that kind of yeah. thing, go out to a different country. Amazing. Uh, Jeff, okay, he's telling people to Google it. Dan's prompting your YouTube channel. So, yeah, that's cool. Definitely follow uh, Kevin's YouTube channel. Um, Craig saying, can you imagine the look on my daughter's friends' faces when they all have the Walkmans and my daughter turned up with an MP3 player? Oh, wow, yeah. That's <laughs> definitely mind bone. Uh, and then we've got iPads. Went through a Palm, oh, a palm Pilot as well. Yes, excellent. Okay, uh, iPod old tech, uh, oh, Adam saying, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> triangulization of phones and personalization of marketing. The precursor to more is that GPS, yeah, definitely a privacy issue. Brilliant, thank you. Um, okay, excellent. It's always good to see the conversations going on in the chats there, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's cool. So, we just talked a little bit about your move away from Sony, um, and also your kind of your pivot into, into venture capital um, holdings yeah yep. um and then the next big role after that ceo of american teachers so that seemed to be a new industry is that a new industry new sector absolutely and each yeah. one of these have been kind of new industries you know within sony i was in different divisions um which operated in different ways and then you know going into venture capital starting a company in venture capital and then yeah. taking on repackaging of companies that yeah. were in different industries but business is always the same. There's a lot of yeah. the same transferable skills in every business, right? And it's about kind of showing that you've got those skills to make these things happen. Um, going into American Teachers was was by force, in a sense, mm -hmm. because the venture capital group I was in, the owner, um, who had had some uh, um, disputes that he won with the U.S. government based on saving a banking chain 
and, and actually creating profitability in that banking chain. And the government was supposed to give him a bonus and they wouldn't do it. He got him to do it, but he decided the bonus was so nice. He decided I'm going to shut down. I'm going to move to the Virgin Islands because my doctor's telling me that I've got six months to live. And the guy was, he was huge. He looked like boss hog, right? <laughs> but had smoke cigars and eat uh, wow. uh, chicken fried steak and all that kind of stuff. And it was just a, a very jovial kind of fun person to be around. But he said, you know what? I'm moving to the Bahamas to protect all my assets. And I'm just going to, if I've got six months, I'm going to have fun. And so mm -hmm. he transitioned us all within that venture capital group, which was incredible. Right. Said, okay. What do you want to do? How do you want to do this? And I told yeah. him, you know, I wanted to now look at these kind of uh, private public companies doing turnarounds because part of my exposure at that venture capital group was helping some of their smaller investments create that turnaround opportunity, right? And even combining a couple of companies. So I thought, you know, that's a passion. I'd like to do that. Now, what I quickly found out is when you focus on turnarounds, you really focus on the fact you've got to keep getting jobs, <laughs> right? It's like consulting. They always say, what yeah. do you, what do you, first thing you do when you land a big project is you go look for two more, right? So right. Around business is kind of the same thing, but yeah. uh, focused on American teachers. And that was a, a company that provided internet based tools to school systems right? Sponsored by companies so that if a school system couldn't have their own calendar at the time, and, you know, this was back uh, nine, when, when, no, 2000 something, the early 2000s, they, they didn't have the access to the technology nor the funding to create their own. So what this brought in was calendaring. Um, it brought in uh, the ability to create uh, the coursework, Right, right there. Yeah. Um, it had uh, private conference rooms where you could have parent teacher conferences. You didn't have to go to the school to have it, you know, so all those kind of things in there. And it didn't have a good um, sponsorship. And so what we did is we looked at the industry and said, who needs to get into school systems in the US that is having a problem getting in and would pay to get in, right? Because they can afford it. And that was retirement planners. And so okay. we created a uh, accredited retirement planners program where they would sponsor school districts. So wow. they go out the school districts yeah. say, I can bring you all these great internet tools if you allow me to, you know, have access, talk to the teachers, do the retirement plans, no yeah. you know, requirement. But that became a national sponsorship that was very successful. And we actually got that all the way to the point of, packaging it up, getting an incredible offer from a very large uh, insurance company to take on the whole thing, right? Put it in front of the board. The board had um, 146 shareholders. Each right. had a chunk of money in it, right? Each had a problem with how it had been run before I got there. So we got all the way to that point where it was a very, very good uh, you know, purchase would have made everybody whole. But when everybody came into that business with the internet, they were being told you'll make a hundred fold your money. I was just trying to get them their money back. Yeah. right? And they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't yeah. vote on it. And we lost the deal. And I said, you know what? I can see the future here. We can keep running mm -hmm. this and it's kind of fun, but I can see we're never going to get to that point of selling this. Right. Yeah. If I'm going to do a turnaround. We got to get to that point. I resigned from that. And I also resigned from that because I was interested in another organization and that was Thomas Nelson and Thomas Nelson, uh, oldest Christian publishing company in the world at the time. It, it still is, I guess it's been bought by several different groups Yeah, and they had a division that was selling books to schools as a fundraiser. Okay but they had none of the right tools. They didn't have a website that could be customized to the school. That was one thing I brought into the fold. They didn't have um, actual printed uh, catalogs that would have the school logos in them and, and concepts like that. I was able to take that division, which had been failing for 13 years, I'd been losing money, but it was always kind of like the feel good part of the company, right? And yeah. people were attracted to the company because of it. 
the school fundraising division, I was able to take it into profitability. I thought it was going to take three years. Mm -hmm. Did it in 10 months. Wow, that's amazing. Well, the problem is I moved my family from, from Dallas at the time to Nashville. We love Nashville. Fantastic mm -hmm. place. We move everybody out there. And then 10 months, we know we've got this thing solved. Mm -hmm. Then they decided to take the company because all divisions then were profitable. They decided to take the company from private or pardon me, from public back to private, which is not normally the direction you go. Right. Yeah. And they did that to ease the sale. And they sold the company. Well, the new owner didn't like school sales. He didn't see that as a value, even though it was finally profitable, because he looked at it and said, well, for X amount of years, it was unprofitable. Maybe this is a fluke, right? And so they said, you know, we're going to we're going to end this. We're going to shut this down. And, you know, it was the first time I actually had to do a mass layoff. Right. I, you know, I had to bring people in and take people out over the years. Oh, it's horrible. This was the first time mm -hmm. I had to let 65 incredible, passionate people go. And mm -hmm. I think I spent uh, almost six months finding, trying to find them places, right? Yeah. Uh, sure. You know, yeah. because they were so incredible. Uh, yeah. Lessons learned in that. And I thought, you know what? I really don't want to do turnarounds anymore, really? but I'm starting to get known for that. And so sometimes the things we do, if we don't really think about the end result, we can get known for the wrong things, right? Or yeah, things we decide yeah. we really don't want to do, but you don't yeah. know until you've done it. No, and that actually leads me to another question, which is about value. So we always seem to end up talking about values on career stories. So, and I think that probably demonstrates it there. So does, do your personal values have an impact on the type of client you work for or the job that you go for, the role Absolutely. of work you'll do? And, you know, I, I spend a lot of time talking with clients before engaging with a client. And, mm. you know, I always tell them the reason is I've got to be comfortable with you and you've got to be comfortable with me. Yeah. And it's not always right. Yeah. And I've turned down business that says, we, we want to go with you. We're, and it, if it didn't feel right, then we just said, you know what? I maybe refer you to somebody yeah. to yeah. take care of you because yeah. this doesn't feel quite right to me. Yeah. You know? And I've had it on the other side, <laughs> you know, yeah. but that's the way you should do things. You know, yeah, if you ever yeah. feel like you're making a deal that's going to compromise you, yeah. you shouldn't be making that deal. Yeah. You no, know? that's really true. That's really yeah. true. So uh, we're starting to run a short of time, but so uh, we were talking, we're talking off screen maybe a bit about the kind of all the layoffs that are going or redundancies that are going on at the moment, uh, the English American language there. So what advice do you give to people that are maybe going through a layoff right now or someone who is wanting to make a career pivot? It sucks. Yeah. There's no doubt, but you, yeah. you've got to get that out of your system. If you need to take a break, if you need to pick a week off or two weeks off and just go, you know, detox, but you got to get back in the swing. You got to mm -hmm. figure out what do you want to do next? And you got to put a purposeful plan together to get there. So that's a couple of things, right? You got to know what you do well, where yeah. you want to go, and yeah. then begin that targeting of that process. So following companies, following people, get involved. LinkedIn is incredible for that. Yeah. There's nowhere else that you can do this kind of self-marketing, but LinkedIn, even yeah. on this particular event, if somebody clicks on that networking tab, you can network with anybody who said they're going to attend and actually attended this event. Yeah. You can exactly. send them a direct yeah. message, right? Yeah. So the opportunities on LinkedIn are incredible, but you know, a lot of that is you, you've got to get it out of your system and then focus, put a plan together to get to where you want to go yeah. and use every tool. I know there's yeah, people who say, yeah. don't apply online because it never works. Don't network because it doesn't work. Yeah. Use every tool you've got, right? And use it in the right amount and use it intelligently. Yeah. So, you know, we know in digital processing, there's a lot going on. They're filtering for keywords. They're filtering for risk. Uh, you know, all sorts of algorithms that are running. We know that. So yeah. do things intelligently when you approach them. Same thing yeah. into the networking process. Uh, you know, do your research before you begin pushing forward. Follow people, comment behind people, build a relationship that potentially moves you forward. 
Yeah. And just have the confidence, I think. That's the thing, isn't it? I've been working with a client this week and um, or last week, actually, but she she wasn't even on LinkedIn. So I was like, right, let's go on LinkedIn, set your profile up. And she was like, oh, I don't really want to connect with people that I worked with years ago. They won't remember me. I was like, well, I'm sure they will. So, you know, let's you know, let's do it. And she's ended up finding a role on LinkedIn, um, finding someone that works in that team that she knew, had a conversation and is in there today for an interview, actually. So that's, that's fantastic. From, from someone who didn't want to go on LinkedIn, she's like amazed at how much she's got from it. It is it, quite sometimes incredible. Sometimes weakest link, right? Yeah. It yeah. can be extremely powerful. Sometimes our strongest links have this bias about us. Yeah, and true. Sometimes yeah. they have a little too much of their own name in the game, right? Yeah, when you need yeah. introductions and like that. So sometimes that weakest link, the people that you think might have forgotten you yeah. or that you don't even know can be huge champions for you. Yeah, One of the exactly. things I always tell people, if you're networking your way into an organization, the first thing, if you're talking with people, you're having these informational kind of interviews with them, you know, always ask them, do you have a referral program? Yeah. Because many yeah. do. And, yeah. you know, who doesn't need an extra 500, 2,000, whatever it is. Whatever when I was is, at yeah. American Heart Association, it was 10,000. Wow. Five on hiring, five at the end of the year. So on the weekends, I became a recruiter and I yeah. brought 10 people in. Yeah. Oh, boy. No. I made yeah. an extra salary, Yeah. <laughs> you know, based on a kind of a side gig. Yeah. Those why people not? are doing the same thing. If you tell yeah. them that. All of a sudden, it goes from that informational interview, I'll help you if I can, to let me give you the inside scoop. Let me get yeah. you in front of the right people, right? Because they're thinking, there's my bass boat payment. Yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> yeah. Really true. Really true. There's my vacation for my family. And uh, they seem like a good person. I'm going to help them above and yeah. beyond I would Why if not? I had nothing else in it. So yeah. always yeah. ask. Yeah. Um, Adam's come back to say, whilst LinkedIn's a great tool for finding a job or looking to pivot, there are many who then just abandon the tools once they've got their job and abandoning those alleged relationships. So yeah, I, that's very true, isn't it? It's like a sales funnel, right? Yeah. If you stop putting things in the funnel because you're dealing with an opportunity, yeah. the funnel runs dry. Yeah. It takes a lot longer to revamp and then get that funnel running again than it does to continue it. And so maybe you know it, it changes when you land your job to helping others land jobs. Yeah, exactly. But you keep yeah. that process going. And, and what builds there is reciprocity, right? When mm. it becomes your time, and it always does become your time again, right? Yeah, yeah. It's inevitable these days. Uh, that's how companies are. When it becomes your time, you have now more champions because you took that time when you were working to spend just a few minutes a day helping others move forward. Yeah. They do remember it. And Definitely. you know that's a huge Definitely. opportunity, but yeah. always keep it moving because you just don't know. Yeah, that's true. So, in terms of your LinkedIn knowledge, Kevin, obviously you've got a, a massive amount of knowledge. And how how do you stay on top of everything that's coming up all the time on LinkedIn? You're the first to know everything, really, aren't you? <laughs> Lots of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a passion. I, I live it again. I love technology. I like kind of getting behind things and trying to yeah. figure out why they're doing it. You know, yeah. how does it work within the database? Um, I try to provide people at LinkedIn a lot of feedback yeah. directly to them. Nobody else, right, to them. Okay, Building yeah. those relationships, right? Kind of, uh, I always say it's good to have a friend inside, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> because yeah, they help definitely. me. They yeah. help me understand what's coming. They help me uh, if I ask the right questions and they then say, I can't tell you anymore. I know I'm on it, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, it again, it's, it's that passion. And then other people have figured this out and kind of joined in to help me. So, yeah. you know, I do share new LinkedIn features constantly, but yeah. I don't find them all. Yeah. I always say I've got a, a you know, a tribe mm -hmm. of eagle eyed, uh, caring heart people who want everybody to know this. They don't want to keep it for themselves. That's my advantage, right? We yeah. want to share it with everyone. And understand, you know, what does it do? How's it going to make me better? Mm. Should I avoid it, right? Because yeah. sometimes these things aren't good for us. They're good for LinkedIn. So yeah. that understanding and that sharing, I think just uh, it helps me continue my momentum in my knowledge in LinkedIn and, and hopefully yeah. make others better as well. Yeah, excellent. Okay. So as I said, we are short on time now, but should we just talk? What's next for you in your work? 
Mm. Oh, we didn't even talk about AHA either. I okay. know, I know. <laughs> I know if, you go, if you've got time, more, more than happy to carry on. You know, it, uh, this is what's next. I love yeah. what I'm doing. Uh, yeah. You know, with AHA, I was traveling 80% of my month all over the world. Yeah. Opened up offices in Hong Kong, uh, Belgium, United Arab Emirates, uh, Puerto Rico, hired people, mm. ran all mm. that. But I was always gone. I'm raising kids and raising a family. And I just said, you know, it's got to, I got to put the brakes on. Yeah. So I became the international guy who didn't travel, you know, <laughs> and then management changed. And I said, you know, this is my time to go yeah. do something else. Yeah. Um, my wife is an incredible writer. And I said, you know what? I'm a marketing writer, which doesn't make you incredible, but it makes you fun. Right. <laughs> so she's got this very technical side of how, how does, structure and the psychology of reading how does it all fit in and i've got this other side which is the kind of creative you know bam in your face how do you make people remember you we combine those two to help people in transition mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. there's just an incredible beauty in that but because you know a, a client becomes a, a friend ultimately mm -hmm. uh because you're changing their lives in ways they never really thought about and it yeah. doesn't just mean for the next opportunity they get smart and I've actually learned things from clients that I started the seed, right? And now yeah. they're like, wow. And I'm just like, I can't believe. You remember when we first started talking, you didn't want to get on the internet. You know, you didn't want to, you didn't want to do yeah. this. Now you're doing, you know, lives and podcasts and, yeah, and yeah. you know, you've created your own nonprofit and, you know, just that momentum to watch is, I think the greatest payback, right? For what we yeah. do. And, Agree. Uh, yeah. You know, to me, I, I don't see that changing. Mm. No, that's good. Really good. Yeah. Okay. So best way for people to get in touch with you, Kevin? You know, it's LinkedIn? always LinkedIn. And oh, right, I'm a little unique things. in my URL. It's, uh, you know, linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash president. Yeah. The reason I picked that is I get picked up in every search for who is the president of LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not number one, but I'm usually number three or four or maybe two. Yeah. Right? yeah. It has led to opportunity. So again, about taking those little details yeah. right, and accelerating them to brand you, all sorts of good things can happen. So that's where you're going to find me. The other place is, and this kind of goes back to a, a tagline I use a lot, and that's keep rocking LinkedIn. Okay. Yeah. People do rock, rock LinkedIn and they need mm -hmm. to continue. That's my YouTube channel where I've got okay. over 40 videos there. Many of them will tell you things that no other self-proclaimed LinkedIn expert will tell you mm. and that LinkedIn doesn't like me telling, <laughs> you know, but they're huge in advantage. Things like, you know, when you get into the things like titles on your work experience, if you create your own title, it's not in the database filter. No recruiter is going to find you by that yeah. title. If yeah. you take the drop down, what we call a market value title. Yeah, going to find you. You're going to be top listed. That's where opportunity comes to you and you are in control of the negotiation yeah. at that point. So yeah. all about, you know, lots of great videos on there about making LinkedIn work for you as opposed to you working for LinkedIn. So hopefully people will go there and try that yeah. out. Keep rocking LinkedIn. Yeah, and we'll put that in the chat um, afterwards yeah. so that people can click on that. So thank you very much again, Kevin. It's been really great talking to you. I love those stories right at the beginning with the uh, going out to Japan with the Walkman. I can just visualize that happening. It's really great to hear. I, I know lots of Walkman. people. Do you? Yeah. yeah, I know loads of people have said to me they're really looking forward to um, hearing about your early career. So I'm sure you've, uh, you've uh, satisfied a lot of that today. So that's really cool. Um, so future shows, I've got people booked up till the middle of June now, which is really good. And next Thursday, I am back and I'll be talking to Melanie Seymour, who is client, sorry, global head of client experience at BlackRock. Um, and she's also uh, advisory member for women and banking in finance here in the UK. So um, we worked together ooh, a long time ago, 25 years ago, maybe something like that. When so it's going to be really great. When I was 12, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so very much looking forward to speaking to Mel next week. So thanks again, Kevin. Thank you to everyone that's been watching. And we'll put a couple of links in the comments. And I will see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Have Bye. an incredible week. Thank you.